really good flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a wicked sweet path. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the hierarchy of needs, like, you know. Place to live is way up there. <laughs> we'll get started in one minute then. All of you people sitting in the back, if you're uh, positioning yourselves for an escape like, and notice, <laughs> and I will point you out if you walk out. <laughs> Very crossly. That is so mean. I'm like, I do that. I go to the bathroom really bad. <laughs> Some people have. Like, I did. There was a problem ahead of time, Ellie. No, some people have like urinary problems. They have to go to the bathroom every like like every like, 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 Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Well, once I'm through my like, deciding through this whole thing, I'll probably be racing. So you'll be yeah, so literally half the cast. If you leave early, and then you have urinary problems. Rotate it. Yeah. All right. We're gonna go ahead and get started um, since we're uh, right at the two o'clock time period, and we like to be good and punctual here at Comic Con. I say as a person who has never been punctual at anything in my entire life. So, um, this is the How to Be a Nerd for a Living panel, finding your career in pop culture, nerd culture. Uh, I'm your moderator. My name is Adrian Buskey. I am the host of the Nerd for a Living podcast, which is an interview podcast where we talk to fine folks like the amazing people on stage with me here, people who are working in comics, gaming, anime, film, TV, art, craft, and publishing, anything that sits inside the, uh, the nerd geek space. Uh, we talk to them about their careers, uh, how they pursued them, uh, how they maintain them. And uh, there's about 60 episodes or so right now that you can go and check out. So um, if you have a, an idle moment, hop on your iTunes or whatever you subscribe to your podcast with and uh, give us a subscription if you would. Um, so uh, what we've got here today is uh, a panel full of people across a number of different um, career paths uh, comics and fiction and video games who all work within our sort of genre entertainment space and we're going to talk to all of them about uh, how they got into it and uh, what it's like being in there for a living. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here at the end with Ellie and I'm just going to have you go down, tell your name and give a little background on what it is that you do. Hi, I'm Ellie Ann. Um, I'm a New York Times bestseller of science fiction, fantasy, and thrillers. Um, I've been at it for about six years now. I have eight books out. Um, I have two new books uh, for sale um, in Artist Alley B4. Uh, come find me. And um, I have two comics in production. <laughs> uh, I'm Rachel Stott. I'm a real life English person. Uh, and I talk to you guys. Yep. Look at my teeth. <laughs> I <can't lie. laughs> um, and uh, I draw, oh, to be very stereotypical, I draw the Doctor Who comic. So yeah, I draw 12th Doctor, which is Peter Capaldi, and yeah, do the covers and things like that. Hi, I'm Carol Mertz. Um, I run a software and game development studio here in St. Louis. Uh, we're both Rampant Interactive and Happy Badger Studio. So we make video games, we make software installations, things like that. Um, I also am uh, the president of the St. Louis Game Developer Co-op, which is a nonprofit organization here in the city that supports and provides resources for game developers in St. Louis. Uh, I'm Rick Burchett, I'm local, and uh, I've been drawing comics longer than most of you have been alive. <laughs> uh, yeah, next year will be my 35th year in the business, so mm -hmm. a long time. And in that time, I've drawn just about every character uh, major publishers and worked for a lot of the smaller publishers when I first broke in. They're all out of business now. That's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I'm, I'm still doing it after all this time. All right. So um, as we go along in this conversation, uh, if you guys are on the tweets, uh, you can uh, follow along, quote people, or at us and. You know, continue to be a part of the conversation with it, ask questions for things afterwards, and if uh, you do tweet about the panel, please use the hashtag N4AL. Um, that'll ha allow everybody to you know, see the conversation and, and keep involved in it. So, um, I think what I think is really interesting here is that we actually have like, we have like two comic artists that come from 35 years of experience, and then somebody who broke in just recently in the last couple of years, and so I think that's really a great dynamic to kind of see, and then you're kind of like coming at it from a different angle of being the author, so we have a lot of comics fun in there. Um, Rick, I want to start back down on the end with you, with um, multi Eisner Award winner Rick. Um, you neglected to mention that important piece. That's amazing. Yeah. Can I have one? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 
we'll get you there. We're not doing um, me any good. Yeah. So Rick, I, um, I want to let's step back those three decades, and I want to talk. I want to talk with all of you guys about like where did your career begin? Like how did how did you decide this was the road you wanted to go on to make your living? I knew I wanted to be some kind of cartoonist when I was five years old. Uh, I watched cartoons on TV, you know, back when there were only four channels. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I would draw the characters that I saw on TV, and I just thought every kid did that. And then I discovered newspaper comics, and I thought, well, maybe that's the way to go. And then when I was about five or six, my sister took me to the local drugstore, where there were two spinner racks full of copies. All of that color, all those characters I'd never heard of, and I knew that was it. That was what I had to do. And I just never, ever deviated from that path. I thought about being a stuntman for a while, but, but mostly it was comics. Um, and I just wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, got lots of rejection letters from all major companies. Uh, my parents said, no, don't do that. My dad always said, get a regular job and, and keep, keep, yeah, keep your art as like a sideline, a hobby. And I said, no, why should I do that? Um, so I just kept at it, and uh, it, the funny thing about breaking into comics is it's deceptively easy, because all you have to do is find an editor willing to take a chance on you. Now, the hard part of that is you have to find an editor willing to take a chance on you. <laughs> um, and so you just, you know, you just keep at it. it. Like Harlan Ellison said one time, he said, if you can be discouraged from being a writer, You've got no business being a writer. And comics is kind of the same. Everybody who works in comics wants to be there. It's not a fallback position like, oh, gee, I really want to be a brain surgeon, but I can't do that, so I guess I'll draw comics. Um, everybody wants to do it, and they're willing to accept all the pitfalls of working in that business. Um, everyone is passionate about it. So, you know, you just keep hammering away until somebody will give, take a chance on you. Well, so with Carol, with you in the video game stuff, you didn't actually set out first to be in video games, did you? Right, yeah, my original interest was actually web, web development and animation, um, which were kind of disparate, you know, industries, um, but I originally started um, finding an interest in technology at a really young age. We had computers in the house very early on, and so I started exploring with HTML and CSS, and. Um, kind of found a, a very deep interest in that sort of thing and that sort of that level of technology and creativity and then wound up going to college for animation which I was terrible at um, and then formed a studio uh, six years ago which is the studio that I'm now the partner of um, with my friends to create websites to um, all kinds of like interactive work and design for clients and then uh, about a year into that we just decided you know we've always wanted to make games it's similar to comics we just want to do this so let's just do it and uh, it's been really hard but it's been really rewarding and it's you know the fav my, my favorite industry that I've ever been a part of because uh, game creators are just so interesting and so eccentric and they just want to create cool experiences and it's been really wonderful to, to be able to do that and to to kind of discover what it means to make an experience to craft an experience like that and within gaming, like, what roles do you hold? Because all these guys, we, we have real strong ideas of exactly yeah. what they do, but yours is a little more mercurial. So, so. In, in an indie studio, you kind of do everything, and I, I have kind of done everything. So, you know, as, as the partner, you know, I do a lot of the business and marketing, promotion, PR, but I've also done development. I've created my own games. I've been, you know, like the solo developer on a handful of projects. I've made a card game. I've, you know, I've done animation and art. Uh, I've done design. Um, it's just kind of one of those things where you have to, especially in an indie space, I mean this is going to be different in a AAA studio like EA or Blizzard or something, um, but in an indie space you really have to know how to do everything. Um, and that's, it's been really rewarding because you kind of discover these passions and these love for things that you never knew that you'd be into. So like, you know, like audio design is really, really fun, you know, video editing, so cutting trailers for your game is really, really cool. Um, and it's all, it's all very creative and all very um, just fun to explore all of the different aspects of media within that sort of space. Rachel, now you broke in like in 2014, right? Uh, like January 2015 was when I had my first ever comic published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah. how, what was the lead up to that? Like how long had you been working in the trenches, like getting to that point? Well, it's pretty funny listening to Rick's story because it's essentially exactly the same. Like from the time I was five, I mean the comics I write were different because in England we have these ones for very young kids uh, called the Beano and the Dandy. So when I was, oh, they sound really English names. Uh, <laughs> Beano is like a digestive here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you didn't get any whoops from the audience. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> 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 Dandy 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 yeah, yeah, they're very similar. It's like mini the minx and stuff like that. So, uh, oh, that sounds sexy. It's not. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I uh, I would do like my own little strips for like drawing them out for fun, and then as I got older, I moved on to Spider Man and, and Marvel and superheroes and stuff. And yeah, I had the same thing where my parents were like, "Oh, so when are you gonna, you know, just put it to one side and focus more on drawing greetings cards or something <laughs> where you could make money?" And I was like, "Oh, when I get really sad, maybe." I will. <laughs> um, but the amount of rejection like you'd have to go through is is crazy. Like um, I would every time I would have a portfolio review and they'd be like, you're not good enough, you know, do better, work on this, all this kind of stuff. I go home thinking, oh no, I've wasted my whole life like trying to break in and now it's never gonna happen. And then I literally just looked out that uh, an editor at IDW saw my portfolio at um, uh, London Super Comic Con in April 2014 and then gave me his business card. He was like, yeah, just send me some more pages. And then literally like within a few months, I'd quit my job at a bookshop and was drawing Star Trek full time. Yeah. <laughs> Star Trek and Planet of the Apes, right? It was, yeah. It was really strange because they hadn't announced the crossover. So uh, the editor was emailing me going, oh, and they can't tell me because I'm not the art side yet. They're like, can you draw Charlton Heston for us? <laughs> and so I, I'm like, all right. So I did a couple of, I sent them off. They're like, mm, can you draw William Chatner? And I'm like, I'm just appeasing some random person. It's <laughs> like getting really cool commissions so for like, free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, like, it's for my nephew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, draw them naked. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's Planet of the Apes Star Trek fanfic. Yeah. 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 Actually, it's kind of funny because when I did draw Charlton Hester the first time, it gets sent to his estate who have to sort of verify it. And they did say I drew him too sexy. Because <laughs> I drawn him as sort of a, I'm so used to drawing like male superheroes and they all sort of pose like this. Yeah. And it came back, they're like, no, he's more sort of barrel chested and he's kind of like, mm, so, <laughs> yeah. It was an interesting d development process. <laughs> Can I ask if those were on spec? Uh, yeah, so those were like, I wasn't being paid for that, so yeah. it's kind of like, yeah. but it wasn't a lot, they didn't ask me to do a lot of work, it was just like, just to show I could do likenesses and then, yeah. At least it paid off or something, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of weird actually, because the portfolio I had that he saw that got me the job was a, uh, I drew a short 12th Doctor story as like a fan comic, and so literally like a year later I was drawing the actual 12th Doctor comic, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were talking about rejection letters, so Ellie, as an author, I mean, Speaking of rejection. segue into rejection. <laughs> Just pick up like, the I mean, that, that, but that's a reality of anybody who's writing. So, any, yeah. any human, I would say. Yeah, that too. So, right. how did you how did you get started in your stuff, and then you know how did that dovetail into your own thing? Like, what kind of you know the foibles and troubles and challenges did you face? Um, I had to. I got into the uh, publishing industry by being an editor. Um, so I started editing work for, I started editing for an indie publisher. They really liked it. Then I got uh, my own uh, like, you know, best-selling clients. And um, a lot of people really liked my work as an editor. And then, uh, you know, communication skills, it goes a long way if you're not a jackass, <laughs> don't cheat people, like be professional and don't use like cuss words in front of kids like ever <laughs> and then um and so <laughs> um uh, and so that that's how i i got into it that was how i was able to afford like as i was editing getting paid to edit and i was able to afford to write uh, you know um uh, while i wasn't editing and then um I kept on sending out, you know, I got so many rejections, but my story is, I'm really glad they were rejected. They're pieces of crap, you know? <laughs> like, you, like, usually when people start things, they're, you're really bad at it. And I was super bad at it, so I got rejected. Um, I it wasn't until my fourth novel that I'd written, and my fourth one got published. Um, you know, and then all those three, you know, they, oh man, like probably 
50 rejections. Um, so whenever you send out queries, whenever you send out portfolios, do not, do not stop ever. You send it out, get it out of your brain, you start the next one. I mean like, and then, or you send out, uh, you know, it's, it's not a one pitch, it's like six, you know, and you do your research, you, you figure out who you're talking to, um, that's how you do it. And, but the most important part is that you don't stop creating as you're trying to sell your work. You have to learn how to do both at the same time. You're never, ever going to be able to like, oh, now I'm just gonna be able to write, you know? Oh, now I'm just gonna be able to draw. It's like, no, you're like, you're writing, you're, you're I'm writing as I'm, I'm running this business, you know? And that's, I, mean, I think it's a good point that you basically do become your own small business with any of those kinds of things. Oh, so you're gonna be marketing yourself, is. you're managing all the, yeah. the, the stuff with it, yeah. So when you got started on that, and you said you're an editor first, I, I imagine that has to inform a lot of your knowledge of, of writing, yeah. um, but what other kind of trainings do you have, either formal or experiential, we're gonna pass that down the line too. So like what, you know, to, uh, for the actual craft of writing, how did you learn it? Um, I just read a lot of books on it. And then I did it a lot for free as I was starting out. So I gained a lot of experience working on friends' books. All right. I know Rachel, same question. So for you, I mean, other than just sitting down and drawing, like, did you take classes? Did you go to college? Did you, you know, what did you? I did go to a university, but I didn't do comic books there because they kind of have a, they don't like comic books at English universities. I don't know if it's the same for um, colleges in the U.S., but. Yeah, so all my tutors were like, Dad, wait, why are you drawing Batman? No, draw something good. Uh, <laughs> although that might be because I can't sexy. draw Batman. Too sexy. Too sexy. Too sexy. Not sexy enough. Because uh, it's university and everyone's rude. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, and like when you were saying about how like uh, you have to keep like, because I've got so many like people I know who are trying to break into comics and and what they'll do is they'll be like, I've got this one pitch, and it's yeah. my dream pitch, and it's going to be great. And they send it to one person, it gets rejected, and then they spend the next two years going, I'm useless, and they yeah. didn't like that one pitch, I said no. And it's like, if, the, if I was to like try, because when I was still trying to break in, I would literally find out all the publishers that I thought my work was appropriate for, like that's an important one as well. And when you said like, find out who you're sending it to, there's no point me sending Doctor Who pages to someone that does the My Little Pony comic, because <laughs> they're not going to look at that and go, she could maybe draw ponies. Um, <laughs> they do have a doctor in the My Little Pony stuff. Do they really? Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my yeah, god. Oh, I missed a trick there. Yeah. How much do they pay? <laughs> 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 but yeah, so yeah, I think that's important, is just to like keep at it and like it, sometimes it feels insane, like you're emailing yes. 10 different people, like diff and you've, you've kind of made each because don't copy and paste it as well, because sometimes you'll get copied. Like if I get emails from people going- Now you tell me? <laughs> I'll get emails from people going, can I, you tell me how to break into comics? And they haven't said anything specific about me in it. I can and tell they them. they forget to like change. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. read your comic. Yeah, Steve. Nine, 12, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love your work, Brian Michael Bendis. And I'm just like, ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Carol, um, so we, we you know, we talked about uh, you went to school for animation stuff. Yeah. So when you got into games, that's a totally different thing. So, so we know you skipped that in the university setting. So, um, so how did you actually learn that stuff? What did you dive into? I just started doing it. Um, so yeah, that's really. I mean, especially with with something like games in St. Louis specifically. So St. Louis, we don't have much of a AAA space, which if you're not familiar with the games industry, AAA means the big corporate studios, right? Where you're, you're gonna like work as a cog in the wheel, um, doing the same sort of thing every day, every day. Um, with indie development, when you go into indie development, a lot of people want to have experience in the corporate world so that they can say, I've been working on games for X period of time, I, I've seen how it's done. For us, we didn't have access to that. So we, and we didn't even know that there was a community in St. Louis of people who were doing the same thing as us. So we just said, we're gonna go online, check out some tutorials, download some programs to start making games, and then we just started making games. And they sucked. <laughs> they were bad. And you know, like, it's, that's part of the process, is understanding that, you know, you start out not having any idea what you're doing, and that's okay, that's a part of it. None of us know what we're doing when we start. And so, we just, you know, 
started cranking out games, and you know, at this point I've probably published over a dozen games, most of them are terrible, <laughs> but the, the point is you finish them. You know, you get through the process and you learn from it, you reflect on it and you say, this is what worked, this is what didn't, this is why it failed, or this is what, you know, what succeeded about it, and build off of that. And that's how, you know, right now, you can actually check us out in the gaming space. You know, we've, we're working on our first console title for PlayStation 4, and it's a really cool hovercraft racing game that we're really proud of. So. Um, that's, you know, that's five years of not, you know, from not knowing what we're doing to publishing a crap ton of, you know, mobile games. I'm sorry. <laughs> a, a, a carp ton. <laughs> I, I think um, you can say carp ton. Chil nice there's children. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, especially, you know, if you don't have a space to go or if you don't have the money to go to college or if you don't have, you know, the places to go to get experience, give yourself the experience. That's the most important thing you can do. There's a phrase I really like that's uh, fail early, fail often. Mm -hmm. And particularly do it when nobody's looking. So when you, get, when you get started when nobody's paying attention to you and you're this enigmatic greeter that nobody cares about yet, screw it up all you want because nobody's seeing it yet, you know? Dive I mean, into that. Yeah. One of my favorite lines is the expert has failed more times than the beginner has tried. Yeah. And that's, I, I, I've been using that a lot lately because I think it's so poignant in that, like, it really does drive home the fact that you're going to fail a lot. And what sets you apart from anybody else is the fact that you're going to get beyond those failures and you're going to learn from them instead of just getting hung up on them and then stopping entirely. Rick, so you, now you've been at this for 35 years, so <laughs> you, 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 somewhere along the line, well, early on, you had some sort of education, whether it's self-taught or whatnot, but what I really want to know, in your case, is how you've been teaching yourself as you go along, because you're a very versatile artist. I mean, your style is, is very flexible. You've done lots of different kinds of things out there. So how are you teaching yourself new styles? How are you keeping yourself educated as you go along? Uh, is survival. Um, you have to understand, everybody hold on to your chair really tight here. When I was trying to break into the business, there was no internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, none. So it was a question of how do you find out the information? How do you know what the comic publishers are looking for? How, how do you know what to send them? and there was nowhere. The only way you found out was to send them stuff and then they would send it back and tell you what you did wrong. And so you did have to teach yourself. And at the time, there were no colleges presenting any kind of courses on comics at all. Now, I mean, you've got the Kubert School, practically every major university has at least a course on history of comics. And some of the art departments are having, you know, uh, the thing was, is you had to take what was available and bend it to your will uh, and learn how to draw comics that way. The way I learned was by studying the art of the people who went before me. And, uh, you know, because I, I'm self-taught. I'm completely self-taught. I went to college, but I got a, a degree in education because that was the only thing, besides a fine arts degree, the coffee, that the college offered and I was paying for it. So um, you just had to kind of pick through everything and find out those things that would help. I had one really good piece of advice when I was in high school. I had a very wise uh, counselor in high school. He was also my English teacher. And I asked him one time, I said, what do I need to know to become a cartoonist? And he thought for 15 seconds, and he said, everything. <laughs> and it turns out he was right. And, and, and to that end, there's, all, there's an apocryphal story about one of the old timers, and I wish I could remember who it was. And a young boy came up to him and asked him how he got in. How, would, how do I go about getting into comics? And the guy said, uh, draw everything you see for the next 20 years. <laughs> Which is also pretty much true. Um, you have to be able to draw what you feel like it or not. And remember, there are no paid holidays, no paid sick days, no paid vacations. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We're going to cover that in the challenges section. <laughs> but, but I pretty much had to teach myself, and I didn't have a very good teacher. So it, it's, you know, it's just a matter of being aware of everything. Um, 
and, and I, I hesitate to say this, but comics people are some of the smartest people you will ever find, writers and artists both, because they have to know so many things, so many different disciplines come into play when, when you do this. It's, um, and also comic artists are some of the finest artists in the world. And, and, and I know this because I worked in advertising for 10 years and I got to know a lot of commercial illustrators. And when I told them what I did on the side, they said, I don't know how you do that. You gotta draw the same person over and over again and they gotta look like that same person. I only have to draw this person one time. I use photo reference and trace it and then I paint it in a style. And you've got to recreate this from all angles so it's recognizable for you know, however many pictures in a book. And you have to be careful they're not too sexy. All those facts. Exactly. Yes. I've done all right by it. Uh... <laughs> you got to make sure that Talia Alzul's zipper isn't too far down. Um, so it's, you know, it's just, it's an amazing thing. Uh, the internet and the advent of digital everything is, is so great. And for me to stay in this business that I love, I gotta learn that stuff. You know, I can't sit around. I, you gotta keep moving forward because if you're not moving forward, you're gonna stand still and fall back. And you don't wanna do that. So we're gonna look forward to your Snapchat channel after this, right? <laughs> yes. that's, that's the next week. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna jump back up here with Ellie and I am going to segue out of the challenges section because I wanna know the, the things that you guys face on a day-to-day -day basis that maybe people don't perceive from the outside, like what is the tough stuff like that, like that your career path um, throws in the way? Business before art <laughs> is really like, really what you need to know. So if you um, want to pursue, um, uh, whether it's independent, or honestly, whether you're going with these big publishers, you have to know the numbers. You know, you have to know exactly when you're getting your checks. You have to know how much more you need in order to, you know, make all your uh, all your bills. You know, this is this stuff is very important. Whenever you have a contract, um, you have to be able to um, approach it not like I'm getting paid to do art. It's like no, like what I'm doing right now, like my kids could potentially be making royalties off of my work, you know? So, so think about it, it's business. Um, you, so right now with my uh, comic production, I just learned a bunch of stuff about the numbers in comics. So I want to learn what makes a bestseller in comics. How many thousand copies does the first issue sell? How many thousand copies does the second issue sell? How many hundreds of copies does the third issue sell? You know, and so and then I learned it, and then all of a sudden now I'm I'm heavily considering turning you know one of my comics now pulling out and turning it into a graphic novel because comic is a niche market. Graphic novel, I'll be selling in every Barnes and Noble that there is. It's a business. So even though I love comics and I would love to be in the comic book store. Uh, it makes way better business sense to turn this into a graphic novel, which, you know, Scholastic, uh, Simon & Schuster, they can buy from me, and then, I'll, and then it, it goes up, you know, in, in the, the big, you know, uh, distribution channels. So find the numbers. It's not sexy. It's not fun. You talk to other professionals. You uh, do really nice copy and paste emails to people and ask them like you know like what about these numbers and then and then if you can make it if not then keep it as a fun hobby and i'm serious there's nothing wrong with it you're like i, I wrote a comic it's not my job you know like it's going to be a, a hobby if you don't pay attention to the numbers so and also find yourself a good accountant and all that yeah, yeah. So, um, so Rachel, same question, the challenge is, outside of just the jet lag of being flown into highly glamorous American comic cons. Thank you, uh, talking piece of broccoli. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I see your friend. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Um, but, but, like, I think a lot of, a big thing that people don't think about, especially like with comics specifically, is the time. Like, I mean, I don't know how it is for you. Maybe you draw faster than I do, but for me, it's very rare that I take a day off. Because to take a day off means I have to draw extra fast on the other days or stay up a bit longer. And like, my working day is like, I get up at about seven in the morning and my commute is about 30 seconds between my bed and my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and then I sit there and draw and work through the day and normally don't stop until I get to bed, which is like 11, 12 o'clock, something like that. So, I mean, I do, you know, obviously take time off because I've got a friend somewhere. Because uh, they, <laughs> they um, socialize sounds awesome. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so socializing, but you spend the whole time stood there with a drink in a bar going, I should be at home drink up to who? Oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> if my editor sees me out, I can't tweet about this. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's not fun. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, but the thing is, like, that's why you have to go into it adoring it. Like, it, because there'll be days when, I mean, you guys were saying about, like, can't only draw when you want to draw. There's some days and I'm like, this looks horrible, and like, it's terrible, and I don't want to look at it, and it's awful. But you have to do it because you've got to send it off the next day. So yeah. you're in a business. Yeah, exactly. You have a contract. Yeah. So a plumber doesn't feel like plumbing every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like a big thing for comics is hitting deadlines. Yeah. And there's been a few jobs and editors have said to me like, oh yeah, so we'd like to have you on this, do you hit deadlines? And I'm like, that's like saying someone that works in the shop, will you turn up for your shift on Monday? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what you're paying me to do. Of course I'll do it. Yeah. 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 Sleepy dance, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I'll sleep when I'm dead, which, yeah. because I'm in comics, would be in five years. <laughs> 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 You're proof that you can make it. I can make it. Yes. <laughs> Carol. Yeah, um, making games is hard. Uh, that's really, I mean, like, finding fun is not easy. Making fun is not easy. Um, and there's a lot of iteration that goes into it. And also making money on games is hard. So like you said, you know, like finding the numbers, really like being very careful about turning it into a business. If that's what you want your career to be, you have to, I mean like, you can't just make a game. You have to promote that game. You have to sell that game. You have to know how to talk about the game. You know, like you have to bring it to conventions and show it to people and make sure people know that your game exists. Um, and that's, you know, that's just as much work, if not more sometimes than actually working on the game itself. Um, and I think a lot of indies don't ever realize that going into it. They're just like, I'm gonna make the game and it's just gonna be a sleeper hit and I'm gonna be a millionaire and then I'm gonna, you know, go to the Cayman Islands and retire or whatever at 23. And that's not... That's that, only what a radical ride, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, and you know, and the games industry is interesting because it's so young. And so there are some of those weird, you know, like outlying success stories where it's, you know, a 20 something person or, a, you know, like a small studio of really young folks who, hit it big, or you know, like you see Notch, who's just a billionaire, you know, with one game, um, that's really rare, you know, and it's like, it's like, a, it's like buying a lottery ticket when you make a game, um, and you can do everything that you can to make sure that you know, you know, like, what the numbers might be that are drawn, but like, you can't guarantee success, and that's, that's something that's been a, a huge challenge, but one thing that really helps is just iterating, making sure you show your game to people, making sure you get a lot of feedback, um, getting involved in communities and like getting inspired by other people, hearing other people's stories, making sure you're aware of other people's failings so that you don't make those same mistakes. I mean, there's a lot that you can do to set yourself up for success, but there is no recipe for it. Um, and that's something that's, that's really jarring to a lot of people. You're also in a creative culture time period where people, a lot of times, they want things for free first before they'll pay for them. I think that, that always raises a challenge when you have a creative thing, whether it's music or a game or a book or something like that. They're kind of like, well, give me a little taste of that first. Yeah. You know? And I mean, a pusher, you know? the games industry can be very volatile. I mean, I don't even have to say that, but like, I mean, a lot of us here know, you know, it's, it's not always a safe space. And, you know, especially as a game developer, you know, any choice you make on your game is going to be scrutinized heavily, sometimes <laughs> violently. I mean, we posted our, um, our, we announced our game on the PlayStation blog and people like told us that they wanted us to die for releasing oh an indie game that they didn't <laughs> like the look of. It's just like, it's really messed up. I mean, we've had people, like some of our friends were like, we hope you get AIDS and die for making this free to play. And it's like, that's a scary thing. And like, it's, it's you can't just say water off a duck's back because that's, I mean, that's something that's really intense, but it's something that you have to be aware of when you're, when you're on the internet at all, that's a thing that happens and especially in, the games industry, like game developers are really good people, but sometimes the people who play them are not. <laughs>
<laughs> so, um, Rick, same question with the challenges, and then um, what I want to dovetail into from there is uh, the highlights. I want to hear some of the things that have really made this stuff awesome for you guys. Um, challenges. Uh, what Rachel said, um, yeah. I think also a challenge, and I don't know if you've encountered this, but people don't have a very clear idea of what we do. <laughs> and and by, by that, I'm, I'm saying everybody thinks, I'm gonna blow a lot of minds here, everybody thinks that if you have talent, you can do this. I got news for you, talent doesn't exist. It's hard work. It's learning your craft. If there's any talent involved at all, it's a hand and eye coordination a lot like a basketball player has. You're able, your mind is able to make your hand do what it wants to do. That's as far as it goes. You, it doesn't, having talent isn't going to teach you how to draw a human figure from any possible direction, doing anything you want it to. It takes a lot of hard work. And I was working on Blackhawk, which was set in the late 1940s. I got a script, and the first line was, a street in Singapore, 1947. It took the writer maybe two seconds to type that. <laughs> you have any idea? I get stuff like that a lot on Doctor Who. And It'll it be was, like yeah. page one's on And the this was the before the internet, text. remember? <laughs> so I had to go to libraries. And not only find a street in Singapore, but find a street in Singapore in 1947. <laughs> okay? So there is a lot of work that goes into this stuff. And I don't think people who don't draw have any idea of how much time and effort goes into it. Uh, like Rachel, I work seven days a week. And I don't mind that because that's what it takes to get the job done. Um, so I think the perception of what we do uh, is is skewed because because you know you always and I'm sure you get it too. You'll be at a convention or something, and somebody will come up and say, "Boy, I tell you, I wish I had talent. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler." <laughs> and I, and I'm thinking, if you can't draw a straight line with a ruler, you have more problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's you know or. Or, or you, you know, you'll get somebody. Say, yeah, my nephew, he can draw anything. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. But it's the the thing is, anybody can draw. Okay, anybody can. It's just willing to put in the time and the effort to do it. All right. Um, and so, so to, to flip side, good stuff. Optimism. Um, yeah. Optimism. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, in thirty five years, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, the main thing is waking up in the morning and not dreading going to work to look forward to going to work every morning i worked in a lead smelter when i was young to earn enough money to go to college after that so that's one the second thing is a surreal experience and that was having will eisner hand you an eisner award oh, God. That, he me award. Yeah. Here's me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He when he was still alive, he used to hand out the yeah. awards in San Diego. And uh the one year I was there to get one of them, he, he was there handing him out. And uh, it was and then I got I got to talk to him afterwards after the ceremonies and I got him to autograph my eyes. Oh, oh, no. So so that that that's kinda like the coolest thing. So that's the one you're going to give to her, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the one I'll steal from your house. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Carol, beat that. With optimism? Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't won any awards. Um, it's like, my grab. <laughs> well, I did that one backwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I kind of started uh, early on in the talk, Making fun is really cool, and like creating experiences is really cool. And I think games are a really unique medium in which you can really, you can create an experience unlike any other. I mean, like comics are amazing, books are amazing, you know, films are amazing, but you can't affect the way that they come, like turn out. You can't necessarily, you know, have that, you know, like that integral role within it. 
Um, and that's something that, that creates a sense of um, like feeling a personal connection to things and a sense of empathy that, that many other media cannot provide. Um, and it's really, really exciting to be able to sit down and think, well, what, what do I want other people to feel today? And you know, how can I turn that into a game mechanic? And how can I let people feel that? And I've actually made some personal projects that, um, like a, a game that tries to explain what it's like to be a social introvert. And I've had people reach out and say, that was really cool. Thank you so much for putting that into an experience for me. Or like a game that you know tries to express what it's like to not feel like yourself, to feel like other people are you know dictating who you are. And that's the sort of thing that's really satisfying for me is being able to like really create these experiences for people to, to show what it's like to be someone else or to, to help reinforce that you're not the only one that feels this way, look, you know. Um, so that's that's something that's really magical about the game space that I would say is really magical. That's right. Rachel, you received a really cool piece I of fan I thought you were going to bring this up when you said positives and you said yeah. about the Eisner Award. I was like, I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> I know what might be brought up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I received, like, do you guys know who Peter Capali is, the doctor? Uh, well, anyone that's been on my Twitter feed has seen my pin tweet, which is me freaking out because he sent me a painting of the doctor. So he sent me a painting of himself. <laughs> and a nice little message of, yeah. like, thanking you for your work. Yeah, he said, like, thank you very much for your work on the comic. And, uh, and it was really funny, though, because I, uh, so he sent it through, like, an agent at the BBC. And I replied to her going like, oh, do you mind if I send like a picture back with a thank you? And she was like, yeah, sure. And I thought, should I paint myself? <laughs> I was like, it would make a really good joke, but I said, like, because I didn't know him, he might have opened it and been like, wow, cocky. Like, <laughs> just like a black and white booty on a beach, just like, <laughs> so yeah, so I didn't do that. In the end, I drew him, and then I posted, and I was like, oh, he's probably got like a billion drawings of himself to like add it to the pile. Well, it's not just like add it to the pile. <laughs> yes. Draw yourself with him. Oh yeah, <laughs> just like <laughs> with him looking like. Oh, yeah. like <laughs> not not like a romantic, sexy photo, but yeah, like a total yeah. like. Exactly. Uh, just, but, um, going back to what Rick said, like I know I was saying how hard the job is and stuff, but I, I, people, I see friends and family talk about having the Sunday blues and hating Mondays, and I see Garfield talk about it all the time. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, I adore my job. Like I, I absolutely adore going to work every single day after my commute, and uh, <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, so it's worth it. And Peter Capaldi sent me a painting. <laughs> Uh, like last time I talked about the business side, so the, the, the success that high is the art side, you know, like you, you, there's nothing like expressing yourself and then forming this, you know, bridge between you and another person. Um, it's magic, it's story, you know, like we are all connected that way because um, we're all at a Comic Con right now, you know, so stories have connected us. And, um, but um, one of my favorite experiences definitely was um, my, one of my first books, The Silver Sickle, takes place in a, a um, Middle Eastern steampunk culture. And, and then uh, a Middle Eastern girl um, came up to me and she said, this is the very first book where I, I was the hero, where I saw myself in this book. She was crying, and then I was crying, and then everyone was crying. Like, it was amazing, and, and so and so that's like what this is for me. I, I want, um, you know, whether it's someone who like literally sees themselves, yeah, you know, like her features and her culture. She was seeing herself, or just like other people can put yourself in each other's shoes. You know, that's how we make a much kinder world. And so that's what fiction is to me. That's awesome. Well, we um we have like just a couple of minutes. Um, there's a mic down there on the floor. If it works, that would be cool. If not, talk loud. But if you have questions for our panel, we'd love to get you up here. So if we get a couple of minutes, let's do a Q and A. Charge. <laughs> Beat him. Hello. It works. <laughs> Hello. Fantastic. You've actually got a loud voice. <laughs> okay. So I'm Erin of Erin Error. About a month and a half ago, I started my own business, sole proprietor. Yay. Congratulations. Um, 
Congratulations. Thank you. It immediately took off and was amazingly successful from the get-go, and I guess it's more successful every day. Yay, now you can pay for all of ours. <laughs> Drinks all around. <laughs> fiction and stories do save lives too. Yeah. Okay. They affect lives on a massive level, and uh, what you do is beautiful and one-to-one, -one, but uh, art can also have that kind of effect. And, and I've always found that if you're scared of doing it, you should do it. I've always found you need to get the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that you can afford to quit. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation. I've been having this conversation with a couple of friends lately. Um, and I think it's like it's really amazing that you actually enjoy your existing job because a lot of people are like, I have this job, it pays great, it's it's funding me, but I don't have the energy to work on the creative stuff when I get home. And that's when you need to leave. Sorry. Um, so if you, <laughs> you know, if you feel like you don't have the energy to work on it, then that's a problem. I mean, like if that's your, you know, if it's your passion to be creating, then that's where you need to be. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'm going to move fairly quickly through things really in a couple minutes. I was just going to say, Carol Smugglecraft, awesome. Oh, thank you. Uh, Rachel, I was wondering if you still do uh, Doctor Who fanfic and if you would ever draw yourself as the companion to the Doctor Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never, well, the thing is, I always tell people I'm a terrible writer, so I wouldn't call my comic book fic because it was like the speech was just as like an exclamation point. Or um, but yeah, so uh, I don't do, I have no time for like drawing fan comics anymore, but uh, and I don't have to draw myself. Them, but a handy thing about being five foot two is that Jenna Coleman is the same height. So if I need reference pictures, I can just like get the camera and stand in the mirror and be like, "Hey, my God, stop there!" <laughs> the problem goes when you need reference for Capaldi because then I just stretch in my arms. Yeah. Like, hey, bro, what's up? <laughs> you send me a picture in a specific pose. Yeah, will you like do a handstand and then send me a picture? That'd be great. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the first thing I like to say is hi. I have a bad for crossroads. Roll the dice. I did. Roll the dice. All right. Cool. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> grab some stuff. <laughs> too distracted. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, I'm a father, 41 years old, six years of salary, a mortgage, cars, you know, whatever. But uh, I'm a nerd. I'm a creative. I sit in an office. I hate my job. But I spawned to nerds. <laughs> Doors close. What do I do for that? Be as encouraging as possible. Yeah. In the game dev community, there's parents who bring their young teams to game development events just because they've shown interest. And they these kids have published games before they've graduated high school. You know, like these kids are, you know, networking with professionals before they've, you know, gotten the opportunity to drive, you know, it's it's a pretty amazing thing if there's a supportive parent in the picture. Yeah, I would say um, the doors are never closed, um, in particular, and I know what you mean, but in particular, the doors are wide open for you to participate in their education, uh, in, in their lives doing that stuff. They need that support, everybody needs some kind of support column, so your, it, it might be that your legacy in that kind of thing is through them. So, um, and I think that's, that's just, it doesn't get us more beautiful than that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So with Magnificent Beer. <laughs> I do, I do try. Um, with the artist side, uh, you know, breaking from Rachel, you, you have, it, it is kind of a classic story, you know, parents aren't really that supportive. Uh, oh no, parents are wonderful, but it's just like, no, they no, but it's comics, like, so they this, this is just yeah. a hobby. I'm just realizing they did disown her. My parents are great. <laughs> no, and I didn't mean to make it sound like that. <laughs> Love you, Mom. Love you, Mom. Thank you for uh, some food and jealous. To Carol and Allie, like, what was your support structure like going into these ventures? And um, sort of as a you know sequel to that, and, and Rick and Carol, where you get ready 
very pleased with the answer to this. Uh, what was their reaction when they saw that you were getting uh, success in these meetings? I think the initial reaction from most, you know, family support structures, especially when you're kind of starting into a creative endeavor, is going to be fear for you and concern. Um, the real job thing, when are you gonna get a real job, came from all angles, all the time. Even when starting a studio that was like, you know, essentially, you know, a creative studio for what seemed like a really obvious, you know, like obviously successful thing like web development, even still, just you're striking out on your own, when are you gonna get a real job? When is somebody gonna give you a paycheck? Um, and it took several years of showing, no, I can do this, I'm doing this. Um, before they started really understanding, oh, they're serious. Like this is this is <laughs> what they want to do. Like this is what her career is now. Um, it's hard. And, you know, I've had many many arguments, but um, it's worth it. And if you can finally convince them that you're doing what you should be doing, regardless of how much you're making, you know, I think it's just a matter of sticking to it. Be sure to surround yourself with um, positive. Uh, very positive people and that is not just the art community believe me like you know just be sure to uh, always have those cheerleaders in your life and they can be lots of different people there's a comedian called uh, Dylan Moran I think and he has a quote and he's like one of the worst phrases in the English language is be realistic <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so if you've got someone that's just like no be realistic you know you should go get that shop job it's just like oh, yeah yeah no I don't want to <laughs> Um, but we have like one minute, so if we can charge into the other two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my question is, when you guys were first starting out, were you ever worried about taking a really fun hobby that you enjoyed and turning it into a career and facing all those difficulties we talked about? If it would take away like some of the passion that you originally had, and how would you deal with that? That's no. such a good question. <laughs> That's a really good question, though. Yeah. Yeah. Really good question. No, no, I never, never, ever, ever. I worked at a lot of jobs before I got into comics. I spent 10 years in advertising uh, before I got into comics, but I had hoped that it would be what I wanted it to be, and it was, and even with all the downsides to it, and there are some, um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I worked at a swimming pool for five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say if, if it's working as a hobby for you, uh, then keep it as a hobby. Like, it's so legit to just like write as a hobby, to do art as a hobby. Like, don't, like, like turning it into a profession is not for everyone, it, you know? Um, it's it's a really beautiful thing as a hobby, too. Yeah, do what feels right. right. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're actually at the end of our time. Um, if you want to, please feel free to come up and uh, ask questions of our people afterwards, but I think we need to clear the room and stuff, so. Um, Oh, yeah? oh, okay. I literally thought they were taking the stage apart. <laughs> I'm stealing what we have. Never mind. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, goes through the flush away some people I mean some people like Rick said he kind of knew like right from the beginning um, I, I think in my end that um, dive in and just try stuff out um, I think one of the most difficult things for people when they get into the collegiate system 
is they get attached to something and they do all the theory and they take a lot of courses and then like they're in their fourth year before they get hands on with something and that's when they discover they don't like it. And that's when they discover that they're like, oh, I feel like I wasted my time. The sooner you can get hands on with things, the more, the sooner you can experience what it's really like to do that kind of job, you'll find out if you actually really like it or if you're just curious about it. Part of what's great about college is that it gives you an opportunity to explore. And the more, I mean, like what you're doing now and like trying different things, that's the exact thing you should be doing. You know, explore everything that you can and figure out what it is that really sticks with you. I mean, like I feel you so much because like I said, started out in web design, moved into animation, moved into web and graphic design, now working in games. Like it took a long time for me to figure out what it is that I really care about. And just stay open-minded mm -hmm. to everything. Don't think that anything is an end game for you because especially in this day and age, people change professions so often now. It's not like the old days. When I was a little boy, hey, get off the grass. Um, when I was a little boy, you went to work at a company and that's pretty much where you stay for the rest of your life. Not like that anymore. Uh, you just, just keep your mind open, look around, just stay aware, know when you're enjoying something and don't immediately discount that because you're enjoying it. Well, gee, this, must, this is too much fun. This can't be practical. Yeah, it can. And in this economy as well, like safe options aren't always safe options. If you think like, I'm gonna do something like maths based or you know, all this kind of stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean a guaranteed job at the end of it. So if you find something you think, oh, I really enjoy this, but I don't know, it's, it's not very certain that I'm gonna have something at the end of like a four year, course, um, I'd probably say go for it, but that's based on when I went to university, I had the choice of doing physics, which was my main course of study, or doing illustration at uni, and um, I remember saying to my uh, tutor at the time, like, I know I'm a sort of average physicist, and if I do this, I'll come out with a degree, but I'll end up working in a pipe factory, <laughs> or I can do art, and that's something I feel like I'm half decent at, and I could come out of it with a really nice job. And he said to me, like, we can't all have fun jobs. Some of us have to make the pipes. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I'm going to do the art, please. I'm going to make pipes. <laughs> so, yeah. so always follow your own instincts. Even if someone that's like more with more authority and older or anything like that is telling you something different, they don't necessarily know better than you. Yeah, they may know the subject, but they don't know you. Yeah. Does that help? He's like, no. <laughs> we, got one, we got one guy after you here, and then we really do have to cap it and wrap up. So, um, the opportunity to make a game um, and then eventually you know come to game developer events join the community start meeting people you might be able to meet people who you can work on personal projects with in collaboration because collaborating is huge and it's it's necessary for most game projects um, but, but I was gonna say just collaborate yeah. like you said if you say you're not creative like you aren't everything none of us are like it's all collaboration and also, um, sometimes the best problem solvers are not necessarily creative people, but they're people that can look at, it, at, it, at an issue and, and discover new ways around them. It's a really valuable skill, particularly as a programmer, anybody working in code. So if you find that, that you can think those ways around problems that other people don't see, it can be really, really valuable. Okay? All right, guys, thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Our panelists are all out on the uh, on the floor in Artist Alley or in the game section. You have one hour to come and buy all of their things, so please do it. Thank you so much.